Good evening and welcome to Scotland at 7 here on Broadcasting Scotland. My name's Kenny McBride and I'm joined this evening by two excellent guests. First by longtime friend of the show, activist and campaigner Ellen Hofer. Ellen, how are you doing? Okay, we think we've we got Ellen there. Ellen, can you hear me? Oh, we're not hearing you just now, so while we get that fixed, I'll turn and introduce my other guest, uh, who is a writer with The National and former SNP MP, George, Gar George Caravan. George, how are you doing today? Good evening. I'm very well today. Nice sunny day here in Edinburgh. Lucky you. <laughs> it's not been quite so bright here in Glasgow. Uh, but we will move on just now and start, as we always do, with our coronavirus statistics update. And as of 2pm today, a total of 770,729 people in Scotland have been tested through NHS Scotland Labs and UK Government Regional Testing Centres. Of these, 742,125 were confirmed negative, 28,604 were positive. There were 806 new confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Scotland today, although it should be noted that roughly 300 of those were tests that occurred at the weekend but weren't reported at the weekend. There were thankfully zero new reported deaths of people who have tested positive today. This will of course be a to an underestimate of the total number of cases as not everyone with the virus Can will you hear me now, Linda? and not all those with symptoms will be tested. But not before? I think we've got uh, Ellen there now, so that's a good sign. Uh, but I'll carry on. Uh, yeah, um, we, we do urge you, if you are showing symptoms of a new persistent cough, a temperature or a change in your sense of taste and smell, that you do book a test as quickly as you can. And also download uh, the Protect Scotland app uh, as well to help with contact tracing. Of the people who have tested positive, there were 123 people in hospital last night, 14 of whom were in intensive care. And the number of patients in Scotland who have died from complications caused by the corona coronavirus infection now stands at 2,512. This number only includes those who have died in hospital having received a positive test for the virus. And the latest UK daily figures available show that 42,072 patients who tested positive for COVID-19 have sadly died from their illness, an increase of 71 since yesterday. This number refers to deaths in all settings, not just those in hospitals. And before we go on with the rest of tonight's news, if you would like to join the conversation here, you can do so by following us on Twitter and using the hashtag Scotland at seven. That's hashtag Scotland AT and the number seven. Uh, we will, as you can see, be flashing some of those tweets up on the screen throughout the show. But our first story tonight, the SNP has said Boris Johnson is playing games with the EU when he should be protecting jobs as time runs out to agree a Brexit trade deal. With formal trade talks resuming today and just weeks left until the deadline for a deal, Ian Blackford MP said all of the extreme Brexit options being considered by the Tories would be devastating for Scotland, hitting businesses, jobs, living standards and the economy at the worst possible time. The SNP Westminster leader said the Tories had made a grave error by refusing to extend the transition period and choosing to crash out in the middle of a pandemic, and said the only way to protect Scotland's place in Europe is to become an independent country. Uh, so George, um, with your uh, years of experience as a journalist and your, your wee bit of experience as an MP, uh, have you ever seen anything quite as chaotic as this uh, Brexit process? Well, you're absolutely right, it's totally chaotic. And when you have that kind of madness going on, the problem is somebody can make a mistake, somebody can miscalculate, we could then end up crashing out the end of December. Now, I'm a bit of a contrarian. I don't actually think that's going to happen. I think both sides are, are, uh, are playing a game of chicken with the other. Uh, and I suspect they will do a last minute deal simply because it would be uh, a massive crisis for both sides uh, if, if, the, if it came to you know uh, WTO rules, mm -hmm. which is what happens if they don't do a deal. And you then get um, lots of tariffs slapped on. Uh, you just can't really travel. It's a big, big disaster. Um, big pile of backs of lawyers. So I think they will do a deal. Now they might leave some things on the table. They might, you know, they might fudge it at the edges and say, "Well, we'll come back." And there will be a deal. Was my betting. And we're just being, we're just, they're just playing kind of tough 
tough negotiators at the moment. Um, but some things could get left off, and fishing's a big thing that's still you know, uh, going to cause problems. Who knows? They might kick that into touch. Mm. So if you if you think a deal can be done, what do you think is is holding it up then? Is this just a brinkmanship where both sides are are trying to kind of dare the other into into giving up something? Hi, uh, I mean, as far as I know, sitting from outside, you know, you know, reading the communiques as they come out, um, there the are only two. The, the, most things, right? So they've got two things left to agree on. One is fishing. Uh, the EU wants to keep its fishing rights in, in so-called British waters, which are mostly Scottish waters. And uh, the UK is saying, no, uh, and I think they'll come to a deal eventually. And they'll do it on a time basis. Uh, well, I think what the UK really will come down to is saying, um, we'll renegotiate every year. We'll give you a year's deal, and you know, and they'll take it year by year, which is how other countries uh, uh, deal with the EU, and see if they can squeeze it down that way. The other big thing they haven't agreed on, which might even be a, a bigger sticking point, uh, is um, so-called state aid. Um, the EU rules, tough rules, to stop the Brits um, subsidising, uh, uh, helping industry in Britain which might be a competitive edge mm. against Europe. Now, uh, these rules exist at the moment with the UK in the EU. The trouble is that the Germans and French have never abided by these rules. The rules are imposed on small member states. So the Brits are holding out. Uh, and the real reason there is that Johnson and Cummings and co. have a, a long-term plan. They want to turn Britain into a, a, a bigger Singapore off, offshore of Europe. Uh, they want to create free trade zones and free ports, uh, uh, offer huge big tax incentives, uh, capture all the foreign investment, uh, turn Britain into you know, a cheap manufacturer to take out European industry. That's the medium long term plan. And really, the Europeans are trying to figure a way of, a legal way of stopping this happening. Uh, again, they'll fudge it. And actually, as we've now seen, it doesn't matter what the British sign up to, they'll renege anyway. Um, so the Europeans will, you know, it's just coming down the line whether the Europeans want it or not. Mm. Now, Ellen, um, obviously, whether or not a deal is done, there is still very, very little time to get prepared for this. And I know, obviously, the, the impact on EU citizens has been a huge concern of yours. How are you feeling as you look at the, the clock ticking down just now? I think George and I are kind of disagreed on what is happening and whether a no deal Brexit will happen or not. I'm reminded that just two or so years ago, Alan Smith was jumping all over the media saying, oh, don't worry about Theresa May and her deal. Um, she, you know, she won't do a no deal Brexit. She just wants to push through her inferior deal. Um, and we all learned that it wasn't really up to Theresa May. There is a a political current going through Westminster that kind of reflects the undereducated public in, in where the majority of the voters reside in the UK. Uh, and that's reflected in the parliament. And that is what pushes policy. You can push somebody who doesn't know where they're going quite far into the wrong direction. And I think a no deal Brexit is not necessarily down to Johnson. It's down to the fact that nobody can agree on anything anymore. The discussion isn't factual. And the, the biggest indicator for all of this is actually that we were meant to leave the European Union two times before we actually exited at the beginning of this year. Mm. Um, at this point, the UK should be prepared. It's a bit like with independence. Um, there is physical things that need to be done to prepare the to even the way towards political changes. And if you don't see the indicators of that work being carried out, you can be pretty damn sure that that work is not being carried out that's being ill prepared, that's not expecting there to be an actual need to do all of this, but it doesn't say that it won't happen anyway. Mm. And there were other reports came out today talking about the, the threat to particularly the care sector, because so many uh, people in the care sector come from uh, outside the UK. Um, how big a, an issue do you think that that kind of thing is going to be uh, when Brexit hits? 
A lot of people may not want to stay any longer, and yet we're in the middle of winter, in the middle of a pandemic. I mean, it does pose a real problem if we, if we suddenly lose a whole lot of European citizens. I mean, that's a problem at all times, really. Um, mm. And especially since the Brexit referendum in 2016, we have seen that the EU citizens that leave tend to be either middle, middle class kind of level of EU citizens with a fairly high level of education and a high salary mm -hmm. um, that affords them the freedom to move from country to country when they feel that there's a better political reality, as well as key workers. And that's key workers that are universally um, able to find jobs because across Europe and across their, their remit, they are able to find work. Um, this is particularly true as far as I am being made aware over the last couple of years for Eastern European carers who just say, Look, we, we don't need this. We don't yeah. need the uncertainty. There's people looking for us. Um, the pay for a carer in, for example, Germany is about three times what they get in the UK an hour. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a no brainer if you're, if you're looking for the economic migrants coming kindly to take the money out of the UK and send it back to their families. They can do that better somewhere else that's closer to home and that treats them with more dignity. Yeah. And George, uh, just before we move on from this, um, you've said you do have a, a fair degree of confidence that some rabbit can be pulled out of the hat. But there is still a lot of preparation work that hasn't been done in the build up to this. Um, how, how big a problem do you see that being uh, come January the 1st? Well, as I said, there's always the possibility of accidents because it is absolutely true that neither side, neither the Brits nor the EU bureaucracy are negotiating in good faith. Uh, and they're both trying to, there's a scheme of one-upmanship and, and, you know, we're playing with people's lives. So yes, of course, the whole thing could go absolutely belly up at uh, the last minute. Uh, I'm just saying that if you take, things, take one simple example, which is the car industry, um, most of the bits that go in, most of the widgets that go into our, the motor cars that are assembled in Britain mm. come from the EU and then we put the thing together because we've got cheap labour here and then we send the cars back to the EU. Now if trade breaks down, if we don't do a deal, or if they don't do a deal, um, then the bits of cars coming into the UK get a tariff slapped on them and then the cars that we assemble go back to Europe, get another tariff slapped on them. So the whole thing becomes a mess and nobody buys any cars because they're too expensive. Mm. Uh, so that's what think at the end uh, uh, it's in everyone's interest to do a bit of a deal. I don't think they can do all of the deal, uh, uh, presumably they'll do the easy bits, um, but if they, don't, if they don't actually tell uh, the, the companies that are trading uh, early enough so they can do all the paperwork, then of course yes, uh, you know, we, we will, we'll wake up on the 1st of January and it'll be, you know, um, uh, 10 mile, you know, roadblocks at the, uh, at, the, at, the fight, at the Kent border, because mm -hmm. Kent is the new border. Um, so, uh, uh, yes, uh, w w watch the space. I'm just saying that the, 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 the Brits' plan is longer term. It's the, what the Brits really want, they, they want the free trade with the EU because they want to support the EU economy uh, by getting um, cheap labour and, uh, and foreign investment from, from Asia and America here as a way of undercutting Europe. And the Europeans know this, which is why the Europeans are trying to deflect uh, uh, what the UK is up to. Mm. Yeah, well, we should have a better idea of what's happening in the next few weeks, uh, because the EU has said that the middle of October is the deadline. But well, we move on now, and the SNP has said that the Tory government must perform an urgent U-turn over its reckless decision to withdraw support for jobs, after more companies voiced fears of redundancies after the furlough scheme ends next month. Bakery chain Greggs, which has 25,000 workers across Scotland and the UK, is the latest company to indicate it may have to cut staff hours or jobs when the scheme ends. Warning, with the job retention scheme planned to end in October, we're taking steps to ensure that our employment costs reflect the estimated level of demand from November onwards. It comes as a new survey from Censuswide and Virgin Money revealed that 42% of small and medium-sized businesses think they'll have a smaller workforce in December than they did in September, and a quarter think they might go out of business next year amid a second wave of COVID-19. Um, George, what do you make of the changes that have been made in the, the furlough scheme 
uh, as announced by Rishi Sunak this week? Sure. Well, well, Mr. Sunak actually wanted to close down the furlough scheme come the end of October, and that would have been it, right at the start of winter. Uh, and it appears that Johnson um, really took a bit of cold feet about this uh, and forced a change of pace. So Sunak has introduced a kind of bridging. Uh, but all it means is that um, the governments will subsidise uh, the current furloughed workers by about 22% uh, instead of uh, half their wages. So all that's happened with uh, uh, Sunak's mini budget uh, is that the mass redundancies pushed uh, into next year, into April, but they are coming. And so it turned up at the uh, 22 committee, the Tory backbenchers committee. And he told them, he's, he, he wants to get rid of what he calls the zombie jobs, the phantom jobs, the jobs that have been wiped out by the COVID crisis mm -hmm. and the law. Uh, so absolutely, we should be worried. And uh, uh, absolutely, um, even if Sunak has managed to, to kind of, you know, take the issue off the table to be on Christmas, we are going to see a huge unemployment, um, and that's going to lead to defaults in um, people paying their mortgages. It lead to rent evictions, and so come the spring, we're going to have a huge social crisis. Um, and it will be just as we're coming up to the Hollywood elections. Uh, and I just hope that uh, people draw the right conclusions and vote the right way, so that we get out of this lunatic UK economy uh, and look after our own. Mm. And. Uh... Ellen, you know, there's an awful lot of sectors that kind of get left out of this. Um, we've seen, for example, uh, we've talked on here about nightclubs just being told they're not viable anymore and that's the end of it. Uh, but there's so many other people, self-employed people, um, artists, things like that, who are who are not well helped by this. Um, how, how worried are you about some of those people who have been left behind by the, the government support? Well, it's a very direct contrast between what's happening to a UK that has now officially left the EU, but it is still in a grace period of crossing into the unknown in January. Uh, and the European countries like Germany or France, who have already extended their furlough schemes for another year, the kind of oh, uh, I'm not sure how to phrase this, the kind of Tory natural selection process that is being attempted here is quite complicated. Um, I think it would be much easier to hide if, if you know, if the interest was to get rid of the ghost jobs, um, but not damage the people or the economy, then you start really talking seriously about a universal basic income. The scheme as it has now been amended sounds like it's doing much, but it's actually not there to employ as many people as possible or keep as many people as possible in employment. Mm. It is cheaper for organizations to have one full-time worker than two part-time workers on this scheme. Um, and so, I, you know, we can worry about that in the areas of our economy and society that are already affected by unfair contracts and, and um, unflexible to minimal hours um, and that kind of behavior. But generally, I think we need to be worried about every single industry. Yeah. Well, we move on now uh, to two stories that we are going to talk about together. Um, firstly, Scotland's economy has recovered half the fall in GDP, which followed the necessary restrictions imposed in March to control coronavirus, but may still not return to pre-pandemic levels until the end of 2023, a report has found. The latest State of the Economy report, published by Scottish Government Chief Economist Gary Gillespie, also highlights the risks that the Scottish economy is facing as a new phase of support is rolled out and restrictions on businesses and households continue. Unemployment is expected to increase to 8.2% by the end of this year, as the UK government's new job support scheme will provide less extensive support than its predecessor and is not likely to be as effective at suppressing unemployment as the original furlough scheme. And the other story that we're going to talk about here, uh, if I can just find the start of it on my queue here. Um, where has it gone? Excuse me, sorry. Uh, yes, uh, the latest Scottish Social Attitude survey shows that public trust in the Scottish Government to act in Scotland's best interests at more than four times as high as trust in the UK Government. The survey, conducted in 2019-20, before lockdown, 
shows people were nearly five times more likely to say the Scottish Government should have most influence over how the country is run than to say that the UK Government should. The survey measured public attitudes towards trust in government and influence over how Scotland is run, as well as views on the economy, the health service, tax and voting. The findings show that 61% of people trusted the Scottish Government to work in Scotland's best interests, compared with a record low of 15% for the UK Government. 73% of people thought the Scottish Government ought to have the most influence how the, over how the country is run, compared with 15% for the UK Government. 94% of people thought it was important to vote in Scottish Parliament elections and satisfaction with the way the NHS in Scotland is run is at a record high since the survey began, sitting at 65%. And we asked First Minister Nicola Sturgeon about both of these issues at today's daily briefing. First Minister, um, we've seen from the Social Attitudes Survey and a number of other polls that trust in the Scottish Government has remained very high throughout the whole uh, pandemic. I wonder if you could tell us a wee bit about what effect you think that's had on the Scottish Government's ability to manage the, the pandemic. And also, just very quickly, uh, you mentioned the GDP figures today. Um, I wonder how useful you think that is when parts of the economy are still shut down by law, and if maybe now is the time to start considering moving beyond GDP towards a more holistic set of measurements of how the economy and society are doing. Um, on both of those points, Covid aside, um, I'm on record as saying that I think countries should look to move not all beyond GDP in the sense that we stop measuring or looking at GDP, but not having that as the sole measurement of the health of our economy. And that's why Scotland is one of the leading countries in the world in developing the notion of well-being economies, where we consider you know, people's well-being, happiness, health, uh, in addition to the uh, the, the measurements like GDP. So I'm absolutely of that view and I think the experience of COVID probably makes that much more important. And, you know, going beyond that, when you're looking at output figures, we have to take account of the, the fact that those are driven to some extent during a pandemic by the fact that businesses can't trade normally um, as opposed to usually during uh, a period of reduced output where it's the, the overall sort of factors in the economy that are driving that. That doesn't mean the impact of that can be ignored though because it still has an impact in terms of uh, living standards and, and jobs that we have to, to take seriously. And lastly, and very, very briefly on the Scottish Social Attitudes Survey, which is published today, uh, which, you know, I take to these things for granted shows relatively high levels of trust in Scottish Government. Um, I think a, a record high level of satisfaction with how the NHS is run in Scotland. That is, these are findings from pre the COVID period, so they're not influenced by uh, the handling of COVID. O on COVID, I, uh, you know, every government, every government leader right now is taking this, oh, we're trying to plan ahead as far as possible. We are trying to put in place all of the, the right mitigations, uh, but we're also, to some extent, dealing with things on a day-by-day -day basis. And we are all recognising that at some stages we get things wrong and we have to change our approach. This is a, an unpredictable, volatile virus. So I uh, think that for people like me, we just have to stay focused on uh, the job at hand and focused on trying to explain and set out our decisions as clearly as possible to try to encourage the maximum compliance with these difficult but necessary things we're asking people uh, to do. Jason, I don't know if you want to say anything by way of conclusion no, before I think we wind up. I think we're done. Okay, it's not often Jason uh, declines the opportunity back. to speak, but there we go. Did you think we were uh, finished too early? <laughs> So that was uh, First Minister Nicola Sturgeon today. Uh, Ellen, if I could come to you first on that. What did you make of the First Minister's comments on uh, the alternatives to GDP there? I think it's a bit of a change in tone. I remember very well that the First Minister held even a TED talk about how she thought it was important that you know, that governments adopted well-being strategies and a core message of those that represent the well-being message and are trying to um, bring it closer into the mainstream is that, for example, things like inclusive growth and GDP reliance is... Um, I think they would prefer her to hear her say that, yes, we need to move away from GDP because it was never designed to measure an economy and uh, the what we know now socially in 2020 um, and what we know for the next 
decade or so is that we need some radical social change to cope with the environmental and external changes that we're all going through. So um, I think there's a constant balance to be struck especially as the first minister and especially as governmental representative of Scotland. But I see the publications that are coming out of the Scottish government in the last couple of weeks, not least of them uh, taking place yesterday, where the Land Commission released a strategic plan for how they want to go about land reform. And again, it mentions uh, inclusive growth and that because Scotland has limited ma land mass, there needs to be an economic answer to the questions when it comes to um, land reform. I'm sorry, I don't hear the same thing when I listened to the First Minister and went to a look at her policies and uh, mm. I'm, I'm a bit dubious about that answer. I think it fell a bit short of what needed to be said. Mm. And George, what's your feeling about this kind of thing? I mean, it, it does, it, it's something we've discussed on this show before, but GDP is not very useful when the economy is just not able to function at the way it's meant to. And even at the best of times, GDP doesn't tell us a lot. Um, what's your feelings about uh, alternative measurements for the economy? Right. I mean, for 30 years or more, GDP has been a useless measure. It measures how much we're spending. But since a huge chunk of that spending is borrowed, what it's really doing is measuring how much debt we've got. It's not actually measuring anything real in the economy. If you want to measure something real in the economy, you have to measure productivity. Mm. Uh, and I think the productivity targets, because if you can, if you can do more with less, um, then, then the, we get richer and we can spend less time at work. So productivity should be the goal. But as it is, we've got, uh, we've got uh, the infamous growth report uh, from uh, a couple of years ago, which, which uh, uh, focuses targets a doubling of Scottish GDP growth, which is a nonsense. Um, even if we managed it, it would be more debt and, you, and tear up more of the environment. Uh, so my, I, I, I was also a little bit kind of perturbed by um, uh, uh, Nicola's tone. Uh, I think she needs to just, I mean, it's not just a matter of promoting a well-being economy, which is important and is key. It's a matter of saying GDP as an economic tool is dead in the water. Let's get rid of it. Let's use something else. Now, just to give you one per very simple example, um, at, uh, after March, the Scottish economy crashed by about 20%. It's come up about 10%, which means, of course, it's still down 10%. So you can measure growth. It's not real growth. We're still in, you know, we're, we're, we're still in the depths of an economic depression, which is worse than anything we've seen since the 1930s. Mm. And just quickly, George, um, the, the Scottish government, as the First Minister said, this social attitude survey is mostly from last year. But polls since the pandemic started have shown that trust has remained very high in the Scottish government. What do you think is behind that? Uh, um, I think it, it, different things are happening in different parts of society. But I mean, clearly, um, the people who, who in, particularly Edinburgh, middle class professionals who voted no in 2014 because they, they thought that we'd, we'd be taken out of the EU, clearly they've <laughs> totally reversed their opinion. And we got, where is that? Uh, I think I think Nicola has been very steady. I mean, we could disagree with that policy. This policy, I think, decanting people in hospitals into care homes was was badly handled. Um, but you get the sense that the Scottish government and, uh, and the first minister uh, are listening. Are compa she's compassionate. She's trying to do a job in difficult circumstances. Um, uh, whereas uh, uh, Johnson and Cummings and Co are just bonkers. In fact, in the social attitude survey, I'm I'm amazed that. Um, there were 15% of people in Scotland who thought that Westminster was doing a better job uh, of, of running of running the country uh, than Holyrood. I mean, where are these 15%? In the last six months, they've, they've come outdoors and seen what's, what, what's, what's happening. Maybe they'll change their mind. Maybe we'll get to the sensible point where 100% of people think uh, that Holyrood should be running the show. Yeah. Well, we move on now to the other side of the Atlantic and US President Donald Trump and Democratic challenger Joe Biden will meet tonight in the first of three scheduled presidential debates in the run up to Election Day on November 3rd. With more than a million Americans already taking advantage of early and postal voting, time is running out for both candidates to win over the small number of undecided voters in the key swing states. 
Biden has been in the lead nationally in almost every poll for months, but the race is much closer in swing states like Pennsylvania, Wisconsin and Florida. The debate is likely to cover a range of topics, but Trump's leadership during the coronavirus pandemic and his recently revealed tax bills are likely to be of particular interest to many voters. Trump's approval ratings have taken a serious hit during the pandemic, and the emergence of his tax files show him not to be the great business success on which he's built his brand. Meanwhile, the Trump campaign is said to be investing hundreds of thousands of dollars in election lawyers in those key states to challenge aspects of the election. Some US observers fear that Trump may try to dispute the election in court indefinitely and thus somehow cling to power, even if he loses the election. Uh, Ellen, are you planning on staying up late to watch this debate? Nope, <laughs> I'm not. Um, I'm sure I'll get the details uh, in the morning. Um, it's a very, very interesting time to be interested in politics. Um, may you live through interesting times. Um, I think that especially the tax revelation, uh, that was obvious. I mean, for two years, he only paid $750, but that's nothing opposed to the 10 out of 15 years where he paid not a dime of taxes. Um, in terms of the voters, though, and voting, postal voting, and not being able to vote um, in general, the different register, uh, registration laws um, in the US and in the UK, this is a topic that we really need to engage with as well, specifically in the context of a corona crisis. Instead of even considering postponing our elections, now might be a good time to really make a big outreach about postal voting. At least for once, we can be sure that nearly everyone will be at home to receive and participate into mm. into our next general elections and our next um, local elections um, for the time being until there is a vaccine and a way to manage this in across the world and in such intensely social situations as voting where essentially the entire district comes together in one building and walks through those doors yeah. until we have a solution for that we will need to rethink how we do our voting registration and our casting of votes in the mm. uk and we've got you know nine months to come up with it hopefully it's slightly less yeah uh, and George, uh, how seriously do you take some of these uh, warnings that people are making about Trump's intention, uh, allegedly, to to basically squat in the White House if he does lose the election? Well, I mean, my impression is that Trump is a new phenomenon, just as Boris Johnson is, that um, he's not a, certainly not a Democrat. Um, and he surrounds himself with people and his whole rhetoric is anti-democratic institutions. Anybody who's a, a elected official uh, is, is, is clearly the enemy. That's the kind of proto-fascist uh, ideology that's coming out of Trump. Now, fortunately, this is fingers crossed, um, the, the latest YouGov polls, YouGov has a very detailed model of um, how voting would work out at a state level, um, because remember, America is not a democracy uh, in a formal sense. It's uh, you know it votes state by state. Mm -hmm. um, so repeatedly, people the, the, the general electorate votes for one candidate, it's the other one they didn't want. Um, but the YouGov poll, which goes down into the states and models the um, the votes in the electoral college. Um, seems to suggest that uh, that Biden has pulled ahead recently, mm. which is very good news. But we've still got some uh, some weeks to go, and I think the danger, therefore, is that uh, Trump begins to panic and goes into um, uh, overdrive uh, and talks up the dangers, and we begin the um, uh, violence spreading and so on. Would he have the um, the effrontery, and would he have the power uh, to hold on to office? Remember, there's always that gap between the November election mm. and January when the next president is sworn in. Uh, would he have the, uh, uh, the goal to, to try and use that time uh, to gerrymander the vote, particularly if they're going to run through, they're going to rush through uh, 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 filling the vac new vacant seat on Supreme Court, which will give them a 6-3 majority. Will he try and use the Supreme Court um, to, to hang on to power. 
my real worry would be that if he got away with that, then we'd be close to civil war in America. Mm. Um, so I'm, I'm taking a little bit of comfort. I'm not watching tonight because if I watch the debate tonight, I'd end up throwing things at the television. <laughs> so I'm going to my seat. Um, but my, I'm, I'm, I'm holding on to the hope Biden's going to win. Mm. Well, we look east now to another disputed election and the UK joined with Canada to impose travel bans and asset freezes today on Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko, his son and other senior officials over accusations that their government rigged an election and committed violence against protesters. The sanctions are the first to be implemented by major Western powers over the crisis in Belarus, a close Russian ally and are also being seen as the first test of the UK's international impact post-Brexit. More than 12,000 people have been arrested in mass demonstrations since Lukashenko, in power for 26 years, was named the landslide winner of an August 9th presidential election his opponents say was stolen. Lukashenko denies electoral fraud. Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab told journalists that Lukashenko should pay a cost for abusing human rights and rigging votes. Rab also mentioned Lukashenko's ally, Russian President Vladimir Putin, although none of the measures announced today targets Russia. Uh, Ellen, what do you think the impact will be of Britain and Canada standing up to Belarus in this way? It's interesting. I'd quite like to hear more about that sort of attitude from the EU. Once again, there's quite a lot of uh, nation and nation heads of nation that haven't been really vocal but the same is true for what's happening in Catalonia at the minute the next president having been uh, removed so it's <laughs> yeah it's it's yeah. difficult to summarize whether it's going to make any difference but without condemnation nothing is going to change sure uh George what about you what's been your uh view of how things have developed in Belarus since that election at the start of August. Isn't it amazing that um, after decades of oppression, the ordinary people of, of Belarus have just come out onto the street. They come out every Sunday. Thousands of them have been arrested, they've been kidnapped off the street. The leaders have been expelled from the country and they come out. It's the power of the people. That's the lesson I take. As for the sanctions, you know, what moral credibility did the EU have? This is the EU that allowed the, the Spanish state uh, to, to, to for, over, for years now to, to, to try and smash democracy in Catalonia. Only yesterday, when they were signing off, when the EU was signing off on these um, sanctions against Belarus, the EU was keeping its mouth tight shut while the Spanish state removed the elected president of Catalonia from office mm -hmm. for flying a um, the, the EU has no credibility in this. Uh, I, I, I think it's people to people. Uh, I, I am so proud of what's going on in Belarus, uh, and we should be sending our, our... We mustn't forget that the thing is that the ordinary people here in Scotland and elsewhere should not forget that if they come out every Sunday, maybe we should be holding sympathetic demonstrations outside the Scottish Parliament every... You know, um, I mean, socially um, distance and so on. Of course. But we should do something to show the people in Belarus that they're not forgotten, that the ordinary people of Scotland, uh, the ordinary people of Catalonia are standing with them. Yeah, absolutely. <coughs> Excuse me, and we come back to Scotland now. And Scotland's chief statistician has released recorded crime in Scotland 2019 to 20 statistics. The main findings include that between 2018-19 and 1920, crimes recorded by the police in Scotland remained almost unchanged, increasing by less than 1% from 246,480 incidents to, 2004, to, sorry, to 246,516. The recording of crime remains at one of the lowest levels seen since 1974. The 2019-20 figures include 1,681 new crimes re recorded under the Domestic Abuse Act 2018, following its enactment on the 1st of April last year. A further 107 new crimes were recorded towards the end of 2019-20 under the Coronavirus Act and the Health Protection Regulations. Uh, sexual crimes decreased by 1% from 13,500 to just lower than that to 13,364,000. This is the first year since 2008-2009 where sexual crimes haven't increased, though these crimes remain at the second highest level seen since 1971, which is the first year for which comparable groups are available.
So um, we have seen uh, crime in general come well down, uh, Ellen. Uh, having been in the, the country for a while now, do you feel safer now than you did when you arrived? I never felt particularly unsafe in Scotland, though I do have to say that in the last two years, I was unfortunately involved in a case of domestic abuse against a friend of mine, perpetrated against him by a female, his female partner. Um, and to be honest, uh, while I saw the police handling it with great dignity and swift understanding, the prosecution that followed after it effectively allowed the perpetrator to flee the country um, without any further issues to her mm. um, and even if she landed back in the UK um, but not in a Scottish airport she could travel up here by other means of transport and would likely not be uh, stopped in any way mm. so I, I'm, I'm feeling a bit I'm hoping that this is an opportunity to focus on not the uh, arrest and and uh, charge side of life, uh, criminal life, but more on the prosecution side that we have now an opportunity to really deal effectively and clearly uh, with these sort of crimes and find better partnerships across the world and within the UK to make prosecution of criminal behaviour something that becomes possible as a community effort. Yeah. Uh, and George, um, normally we would expect to see crime rise during time during tough economic times, which has been pretty much the whole of the last decade and, and more. And yet we have seen crime fall. Uh, what do you think is is going on there? Um, one of the great drivers of uh, of uh, petty crime, uh, which is not to diminish its impact on people, but, but you know, petty crime. Uh, not murders, which tend to be um, sociologically determined, but mm. in petty crime. It's, it's age. It's the age cohort. Um, uh, a lot of petty crime is uh, amongst young people. And that's not to demonize young people. It's just as as they get socialized and they grow up, you know, they, get, they, you know, they, they, they calm down and the, uh, the, the, there's less of an issue. Um, so it's actually the fact there's a long, long-term demographic uh, as the as the population has stabilised and, and and the birth rate has, has fallen, that actually you would expect, believe it, that, that 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 crime would you know, the, the volume of crime would begin to diminish. I also think that it's got some, you know we, we we've never succumbed to the social panic uh, in other countries and and down south because remember Boris Johnson when he was running for mayor of London just you know ran on a on a on a crime ticket and frightened all the people in the leafy suburbs into thinking there was a crime wave in London when there was as we got in twice. Um, so I think, I think it was slightly more commonsensical in Scotland, plus the, 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 the number of young people has declined a bit, which has taken some of the heat out of it. My worry, actually, medium term, uh, is that um, there's going to be a big backlog of uh, court cases because of the pandemic and the lockdown. Mm. Let's hope that doesn't kind of make people start to um, feel cynical about the about the, the justice system. Uh, so I think we should be, you know, let's, let's bear that in mind, put a bit more resources into making sure that the court backlog doesn't build up too much. Mm, absolutely. New legislation to improve the benefits system to help those who need it most has been unanimously passed by the Scottish Parliament today. The Social Security Administration and Tribunal Membership Scotland Bill supports the delivery of the new Scottish Child Payment to provide low-income families with an additional £10 per week, initially for each child aged under six. The payment, together with the Best Start Grant and Best Start Foods, will provide over £5,200 of financial support for families by the time their first child turns six. For second and subsequent children, this will provide over £4,900. Um, Ellen, the the progress of Social Security Scotland has been perhaps a wee bit slower than a lot of people hoped for, but uh, it is good news to see some of these developments finally getting through all their over past all the legislative hurdles, isn't it? It is. I mean, and though it was small progress, it was progress nonetheless. Um, 
we can work on upping the speed with which we progress, but at least we're moving somewhere. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of heartened by that. I think the crime numbers are also related to how well we do in terms of caring for members in our community and how much we feel integrated and cared for in general, uh, what the social security uh, is that, that backs up our lives and even the possibility of failure, of things going wrong, of, of accidents, of, you know, of the t twists and turns that life takes in Scotland seems to be doing better with every change that we make. Mm. And George, um, obviously there are significant limits on what the Scottish government can do. It doesn't have a huge amount of flexibility in its budget. But these small steps that Social Security Scotland is making, um, they, do, they do send out a message, don't they? Absolutely, they send out a message. I don't want to underestimate the impact uh, that uh, uh, devolution and the Scottish government SNP government in particular have had on poverty levels. Um, uh, uh, since devolution, uh, the, the relative level of, 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 of poverty and child poverty in particular have been reduced vis-a-vis -vis England. And the primary uh, factor involved there is that um, successive administrations, in particular the SNP administrations, have kept down rents in the social rented sector, which is the biggest element of, of people's budgets. Mm. Uh, as, um, social rents in England, the Tories have just let them rip, you know, screwed the, the, uh, the poor people. Um, so even, even if you have minimal controls, if, you're, if your policy is set in the right direction, you can have an impact. Now, of course, with austerity, following the bank crisis in 2008, um, poverty levels in absolute terms have gone up. Uh, but that's not Scotland's fault. That's the, that was the austerity imposed from Westminster, which is not a very good example of why we should be part of the Westminster system. Hmm. Um, I do think we were a little bit slow in getting the machinery of the, uh, uh, of the Scottish uh, uh, welfare system up and running. It's there now. Uh, so let's use it, this would be my view. Mm. Well, we come on to talk a wee bit about health now, and Scotland's chief statistician today released the Scottish Health Survey 2019, providing information on the health and factors relating to health of adults and children in Scotland. The report has a particular focus on adverse childhood experience, or ACEs. In 2019, 15% of adults reported having experienced four or more ACEs. The survey provides the first estimate of national prevalence of these events. Those in the most deprived areas were almost twice as likely as those in the least deprived areas to have experienced four or more ACEs at 20% compared to 11%. And those who experienced four or more ACEs were more likely than those with none to be obese, to smoke, to have a limiting long-term condition, to experience cardiovascular disease, to have lower mental well-being and not to meet the physical activity guidelines. The report also shows 7% of adults reported ever having attempted suicide, which is the highest level ever recorded uh, as compared to 4% 10 years ago. And also we have reports of the lowest rates of smoking in Scotland ever recorded. In 2019, the proportion of adult smoking was 17% down from 28% in 2003, and as I said, the lowest level ever recorded in Scotland. So, uh, Ellen, I mean, there's some good news there regarding things like uh, smoking. I mean, that's always a positive if we're, if we're reducing the number of smokers. But I thought the, the long-term impact of these ACEs on people, uh, that's some really striking research to come out, isn't it? It is, and it's kind of the research that we need. I mean, to be fair, Scotland is a data desert in so many ways, and we need to do more about getting all sorts of data and collating it and get, making it accessible. But specifically on health, um, we need to know what exactly the long-term impacts are. I also think that an interesting insight is about smoking and about drinking. Um, the younger generation is nowhere near as substance-minded as the generations that were before. And that's a really interesting development there. They tend to, I think the younger generation gets a lot of um, bad reputation through stereotypes, but they are more looking into healthy eating. They are more interested in donating money and participating in, in general good stuff for society and get behind projects. Um, they are smoking less, 
less binge drinking, um, I think that's all pretty great news for Scotland and for where we're heading as a society. Mm. Yeah, George, I mean, you've been around the block enough times to to know the history of Scotland as the, the kind of sick man of Europe tag that we had for a long time. These improvements uh, are, are welcome, certainly. What do you make of the the, the improvements that we have seen in, in some of these figures? Um, the, the, the definitely, definitely an improvement. Um, but, you know, I, I'm not one for blaming blaming the Scots for, you know, eating themselves into an early grave or smoking mm. themselves into an grave. We, we live in a social model uh, that forces us to consume. Every time we turn the telly on, there's an ad, you know, there's occasionally a program between the ad breaks. You know, we, we live in a consumerist society that forces us. I mean, I never thought, you know, no ancient, you know, I never thought capitalism, I thought capitalism would kill us by starving us to death. Capitalism is killing us by making us eat ourselves to death. Mm. So unless we can, when we can do, when we should do, we're doing well in dealing with the, the individual um, social and medical problems and socio-medical problems. But we need a fundamental shift in the nature of the society that we live in. A society that says you are just a consuming machine, you should spend this, you should buy, buy as much and eat as much and stuff as much down your throat as possible. That's going to be an unhealthy society. Mm. And that's going to change the social model as well as do all the medical things. Yeah. Well, just quickly then, what, what changes would you, would you like to see? I mean, I, I'm not going to ask you to describe the whole uh, socialist utopia you've got in mind. But in, in terms of improving people's health, what, what changes could we make right now, do you think? No, 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 you don't get it. You don't get it. Yeah, socialist utopia. <laughs> but I, I, I was, the other day I was looking at pictures uh, from my school days of me in, in, in my class. Bobby's obese. Actually, the diet people had, we didn't eat well, but people in the 50s, early 60s, their diet wasn't stuffed full of industrial sugars mm. that we have at the moment, uh, which is the thing. It's not that people eat or eating any more than we did 50 years ago. It's the, it's the industrial and sugar ingredients in some of the things that we, that we take and we're forced to take through all the adverts uh, that are killing us. So, I mean, you don't you have a social utopia to actually have some decent regulation over food standards and food products. Uh, and when we get independence, we'll be able to do that. And that's one of the first things we should be doing. Well, that was a very good answer. And we didn't have to get into the social <laughs> utopia either. Well done. Um, our final story tonight is also health related. Uh, Scotland's health and social care sector will receive £1.1 billion in additional funding to support its work through coronavirus pressures, Health Secretary Jean Freeman has announced. The funding will be allocated to NHS boards and to health and social care partnerships across Scotland to help them meet COVID-19 related costs such as additional staffing or sickness expenditure, enhanced infection prevention and control measures and the purchase of PPE. So Ellen, um, obviously the, the NHS has been under extraordinary strain in coping with COVID. Uh, how do you think the Scottish Government has handled the, the, those demands? I think they've handled them relatively well. Unfortunately, the Scottish government um, has so far benefited in the context of the UK from very little uh, sensible competition. Uh, but in a world context, Scotland does not compare all too well, um, mm. especially in terms of death rate to falling sick rate. Um, where the NHS in Scotland is better equipped to deal with this and policy has changed, excuse the cat in the background. <laughs> um, but it is important that we that we know that the Scottish government is trying to support um, the NHS in Scotland as much as they can. I wish there was more focus on other areas equally as important, for example, renters um, and tenancy rights and support with rental costs, for sure. example. Yeah. Uh, George, um, it, it, did, and whenever we hear new money announced for anything in Scotland, we're always kind of have to take into account, don't we, the, the fact that the Scottish government can't borrow, doesn't, isn't in control of its own budget the way that a normal country is. Uh, do you think the Scottish government is, is keeping up, though? Do you think they're doing enough to, to keep the NHS working to best effect? Well, 
the thing I always worry about when the government announces a big new um, tranche of spending is that you, you actually have to get from the money in the bank to making it work on the front line. And uh, this is not a reference to Scottish government, but all governments sometimes, and all politicians, sometimes fail to make that next set of steps. Mm. Um, I, I, I was in local government uh, for 12 years of my life uh, in Edinburgh, and I, you know, I discovered that you, you, you could pass a motion or you could try to do something, and then when you asked six months later, nothing had happened, and you had to actually, I learned that, you know, when we made a decision, I, went, I had to go to all the meetings of the of the various civil servants to make sure they were actually mm. doing something in front of members' priorities. So uh, this is a good tranche of money. It's an excellent uh, initiative. Um, but the reality is the money, I mean, it's a lot of money, and it's very difficult, actually. This is another issue. It's very difficult to spend big chunks of money quickly and effectively. Mm. Sometimes you just try to go to the door. Um, so uh, uh, I think Jean's made a great initiative here. But what we need to do is to make sure the money is properly spent and i think that raises the whole question that you know um the most effective government is the most devolved government at the lowest level uh and i think we have a very good health service um, but it needs i think a worry that's just too centralized mm. well that is uh an excellent point to finish on i'd like to thank both ellen and george very much for joining us it's been a pleasure talking to both of you and thank you at home for joining us as well. There would be no point in us making these shows at all if we didn't have you. So thank you very much for joining us this evening. Uh, if you would like to support Broadcasting Scotland, then please do, excuse me, uh, please do go to broadcastingscotland.scot slash register. Sign up there as a supporter and your five pounds a month is what lets us keep going here at Broadcasting Scotland. It's pretty much our only source of income uh, and that's what keeps the lights on here. So if you're able to support us, please do. If you can't, we do understand uh, the shows will always be free to view online. Uh, so you will you will always be a, a valued viewer, but you can still make a big difference for us by following us on Twitter at Broadcast Scott by finding our face our Facebook page, uh, by subscribing to our YouTube channel and clicking the bell icon while you're there. That gets you notified when we upload a new video. And then to share those videos around with people, let people know why you support Broadcasting Scotland, what you think uh, is worth watching here, and maybe you can help us grow our audience that way. And finally, we're always looking for new people to work here at Broadcasting Scotland. Uh, we can't offer a lot of money, but we can offer a lot of really excellent experience and training here. Uh, so if you're interested in getting involved in broadcasting and building a better broadcaster for Scotland, whether in front of or behind the camera, then do please get in touch with us. We would love to hear from you. But that is just about all we have time for. So thank you once again to Ellen Hofer and to George Caravan. Uh, I'll be back again tomorrow at the same time with another Scotland at 7. But until then, have a great evening. Good night.